I think when it comes to recession, a lot of companies are affected, but usually those companies are those that are not doing things the way they should be done, right? There's a saying that says, you know, when when the tide is gone, you can see who's been swimming naked. What's going on, y'all? Welcome back to the Struggle to Strength podcast, your source for real life application on how to turn your struggles into strengths in all things mind, muscle, and money. Carl Jakub, CFA. Uh, investing, value creation professional, and very deep individual. Very deep thinker. And it's it's so great that we get to connect to people with people like this because it always it always diverts in a very positive way the theme of the conversation. Whereas we started talking today about things that we can do to prepare for the looming and the incoming recession. And I think I think everyone's going to be really surprised at the answer and the solution that Carl has for us and the the direction that this conversation went, um, but in a really positive and helpful way. Yeah. Yeah. I think you can, you know, every, everyone's definitely looking for like hacks and action items and calls to action that they can, that they can take. And those things are going to be super helpful. Um, but if you're going into a unknown, scary time of struggle, it's all up here is mm -hmm. pretty much it. Yeah. It's all yeah. up here. So we've got some good advice, but, um, definitely get your, get your mind, right. Get your mind. Right. And Carl's got, he's, he's obviously done a lot of work, um, both physically, mentally, emotionally, financially, right. In business and in health. And, uh, he has a lot of really great sort of like key points and resources and things that will make you think about how you're going to actually accomplish your task, how you're actually going to create adverse uh, advantage out of the incoming adversity that you face or the adversities that you face in your life, how to turn your struggles into strength, whole premise of this podcast. So I love this conversation. Honestly, I didn't want it to end. Uh, and um, I've got very low energy. It was very fulfilling. It was very energizing for me. So I know you guys will all enjoy it as well. So tune in, grab your notebooks. I took some notes while we were here. Um, Carl's got a lot of really good things to say. So we will see you guys inside. Enjoy. Well, I guess to get started, well, I would love for you to just take like a few minutes just to introduce yourself, tell the listeners who you are, what you're about, where you're from. We know Chicago. He's a Bulls fan. Um, yeah. And then we'll dive in and start talking about, yeah, this upcoming or this current recession and um, how we can make the most of it. Sure. Thank you, Josh. And thank you, Travis. So my name is Carl Yacoub. I was born in Lebanon. I grew up in Lebanon. Uh, I was a Catholic schoolboy growing up and uh, went to uh, university there. And as soon as I graduated, I moved to Dubai and uh, I moved to work in finance. So I was in Dubai based there, but I was also traveling a lot to the likes of Singapore, uh, Shanghai, London for assignments and deals. And uh, I got really lucky in Dubai because 10 years after I moved there, I met my wife, Hannah, who's from Chicago. And I never thought in a million years that I would meet someone from Chicago and even consider move, moving here. But here we are today. And uh, I have to say, the older you get, the more change gets hard. Uh, and uh, it's been an adjustment. It's been a totally different universe, but I'm really grateful to be here. My background's in investment banking and private equity. So I used to do deals. I still do advisory work. Uh, specifically, I focus on the deal making process. So, how to source opportunities for deal making, how to execute transactions while limiting your downside, and how to manage, you know, the companies that you acquire after you you after you acquire them. And this is a process that a lot of institutional investors call active value creation, which is what I've recently written in my book about, uh, which is all about you know, how to protect a business and its resources, how to optimize a business for growth and how to allocate capital in the most optimal way possible. So I'm really happy to be with you both on this call. And I hope we can talk a lot about, you know, whatever you think your listeners would enjoy, specifically the struggle element, which is something very dear to my heart. Uh, so I'm really excited to be here. Thank you guys. Yeah, I love that. What, a, what an amazing story. And, you know, we, we've talked about this, this many times, you know, the, you made a, a massive 
sort of commitment to to come to the states to move to 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 Chicago. And right before Travis, right before you got on this, I was like, yeah. So I met a girl in in Austin, Texas, and I was living in Colorado. And I guess I moved here. Now Carl's like, yeah. So I was living in Dubai and met a girl from Chicago. And I'm like, oh man, my story sucks now. <laughs> that's a that's a big change. And you're right, enduring change, especially as an adult, is really challenging. Um, we're such creatures of habit. Humans are creatures of habit, creatures of routine, whether it's good or bad. We develop these habits that we sort of begin to live with. And those choices lead us to where we are today and they will lead us to where we're going to get to. And so in the face of adversity, in the face of struggle, in the face of the recession that some people would say we're already in, you know, and Gary Vee, yeah. like Travis said, was was talking about is coming on. That's a huge change. That's a lot of stress and anxiety that we're going to have to deal with. And you can either use that adversity and create an advantage from it, or you can succumb to, you know, the struggle of, you know, why me? Woe is me. And yeah. you can, you can end up worse off. So I, I'd love to hear your take on what, what are some things that we can do to set ourselves up for a sex, successful financial future with this looming recession? Yeah, I think that's a great question, Josh. And I think the, the biggest component in that whole process that we're all going through is attitude and intention. And I think, you know, there is no escaping to suffering as a human being, at least that's my philosophy in life. And the silver lining in those of us who suffer, or at least those of us who admit that they are struggling with whatever that is, is that it's a, it's the best teacher you can find. Because, you know, think about how we approach business and how we approach marketing. The first thing they tell you to do is figure out your customer or your ideal customer's pain points. And so if you are able to identify what your pain points are, I think then you're on that journey, you're on that search to figure out how to resolve these pain points. And oftentimes, the process that I think we need to go through is a process of reinvention, or to simplify it, leveling up who we are or evolving as human beings. That, that's how I like to see it. And that's how I've received my confirmations from, from different uh, ways such as therapy and other ways that I've sought out in order to 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 figure out how to how to best solve that. And one key element that keeps coming up is resistance. You know, as human beings and as creatures of habit, we tend to resist a lot of things when they are not going according to our plans and when they're not within our control. And the antidote to that resistance is first being aware of it. And being able to think, you know, why am I resisting that? Why am I being triggered by that thing that is happening to me? The next thing is to surrender to it. It's to eliminate that friction. Because when you surrender to whatever is making you struggle, you are able to a let go of that resistance, but you are also given the opportunity to reinvent yourself in a way. You're given an opportunity to burn in a way your old, older self, the older version of yourself, or maybe even a lower version of yourself that exists within all of us, right? And as we grow and as we age and as we go through change and mature and evolve, we tend to become more aware of it. And the key here is A, to be aware of it, also to be kind to that lower version of ourselves and not to be ashamed or afraid of letting go, of surrendering so that we can give space to a higher version of ourselves to appear. That's how I like to approach it. So when it comes to business, like you, like you just mentioned, I think it's easy because business is very, you, you could really drill down business into a, into a few key concepts. And I think when it comes to recession, a lot of companies are affected, but usually those companies are those that are not doing things the way they should be done, right? There's a saying that says, you know, when, when the tide is gone, you can see who's been swimming naked. Well, those who have their, you know, their clothes on are not going to be affected by a recession. In fact, they might even benefit from it because it eliminates noise and it eliminates competition from the market. Mm, yeah, that's a great way of of thinking about it. Um, I was I, I, when the last thing you said there, like eliminating noise from the market too. I was thinking about myself, my industry. 
Um, I'm, I have like a media business, you know, we do, um, video or video production company. We do like marketing, um, content creation, marketing type of thing. And that's definitely a field that over the past five years has gotten flooded. There's so many new people joining every day. Um, and I think that that's, that's a great point. It's like, you know, the people who are actually really focused on helping their clients and getting results, probably going to keep like, everybody needs that, you know, but it's, yeah, it probably is going to shake out a lot of the people who don't really necessarily want to be in the industry or, or aren't providing like enough value. It's going to force you to really be like, okay, what, who am I? What is the thing that I do? And how can I do that better than everybody else? Yeah. I feel like the fitness industry is another example. Oh my like God. Everybody, everybody and their mamas of personal trainer now. Dude, it's insane. Ever since COVID hit, you know, people had all this time. And I think that's part of what this is, is, you know, we COVID hit, everybody had a lot of time to explore their other passions, other things that they might want to do. And now that the world is kind of going back to more so the way it was, a lot of that noise is drowning out. So there was this huge influx of people like, you know, in your industry, Travis, who were doing media uh, and, you know, photography and things like that. Same in my industry, people who are all of a sudden there's coaches everywhere. I can help you with this. And half of them are just people who got okay results on their own and thought, Hey, I can probably help a few people. And so that's the noise that we're cutting down. And I love that quote. When the tide has gone, you can see who's been sleeping naked because you can really, once the noise starts to, you know, subside, you can see, like Travis was saying, who's in this for the right reasons. Yeah. Like who's actually trying to help people. That's our mission. I just want to impact lives positively. Who would do this if they were doing it for free? Exactly. Who would still be doing this? Yeah. I love that. The heart is in it. That's a good question is like, Carl, what are some indicators that you're doing things for the wrong reasons? Is it like you're strictly money motivated? You know, like, are you, are you, what, 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 what metrics might someone be paying attention to that would give you an indicator of like, I don't know if you're in this for the right reasons, or maybe you need to shift your focus because the tide's going to go and you're going to have nothing left. I love that question, Josh. And I think it's, it's easier than we like to admit. If you are unhappy or if you're struggling or if you're questioning why am I doing this? Or if you're finding or identifying any friction or resistance within you to your average day, or you feel like you're thinking about another life or what what could your life be had you been doing something else, Mm -hmm. or if you find yourself looking forward to different times when you're not actually present, I think that's a pretty good indication that you're not in it for the right reasons. And you feel like there's you're physically there, but mentally and emotionally you're checked out and that's okay we all have a right to go through these phases of doubts because that in itself is a process of helping us get the answers that we're craving to get Mm -hmm. yeah that's even even the in the like nine to five world like the employee world too i was just thinking about that like thinking about the people who are like who i've worked you know in different companies i've worked with the people who are just like very much working for the weekend versus the people who Mm -hmm. at least at least from the outside seem like they actually want to be there. It's like, yeah, those are the people who get laid off, (laughs) (laughs) which was me. I was the one working, you know, that was me. Most jobs. That's why I do what I do now. And I'm, I'm, you know, because I'm passionate about it, but like most jobs I had, I was like, I don't want to be there. I hate this. You know, just collecting paychecks. And most people aren't present as it is. I mean, I love what I do and I've had to practice being present. I think everybody needs to practice being present because we get so caught up in, you said a word, Carl, you said that you, you mentioned the word craving. We get so caught up in this craving of more and attaching to the concept of more. And that keeps us from being able to stay present. We're always thinking about what's next. What am I going to do next? Like, what am I going to buy next? The next thing I can achieve. And you get so caught up and this is a high performer thing. So I'm sure we all do this. So caught up in that craving, that attachment of more and what's next, it almost creates this sort of destination happiness where you're not actually grateful for what you've done and you, you're you not giving yourself appreciation for how far you've come. You didn't get here by accident. Yeah. 
You know, what you did to get here was very intentional. And it's so interesting that this is the direction that the conversation has taken us, because I think originally the listeners and maybe even ourselves, we were thinking, okay, like, what are some strategies that I can use to make sure I get through this uh, this recession and I can be financially stable? And we're like, dude, it all starts up here, man. Yeah. Like, if you're not present, if you're not grounded, if you're not aware of your current habits, your thought processes, if you're not willing to surrender to what you're resisting, then you're, you're never going to make it. It doesn't matter what strategies you have in place financially. It all starts up here. So this is, I'm loving the direction that this conversation has gone. So something that you mentioned, uh, go ahead, Trav. I just, the last note on that, I saw, you know, I, I do some work in like the MMA, um, like you, I work with like UFC fighters and on this one page I saw, it was like how to prepare yourself for a fight. And this is, this just reminded me of this. I can't remember the point number one, which is like stupid, but, um, point number two was focus on your body. And point number three was, um, uh, make peace with the worst possible outcome. Yeah. So yes, in a, in a fight, when you're going out into like a UFC fight, the worst possible income is that you get your face absolutely smashed in, in front of all your friends and family knocked unconscious and d- dragged out and like potentially so have a brutal. risk of dying. You yeah. know what I mean? Like those it's, it's bad. The, the worst possible outcome is bad, but there's no possible way for you to go into that fight and win. If you're not like, ready for that to happen. And I think that that's, you know, I think like point, point number one was really good too. Um, definitely, but it's, it's all, it's all around kind of like mindset. Like when you're going into a fight, you know, you've got, you've got, um, you've been doing your like drills, you've been sparring, you know, you're, you're in good shape, you weight cut, everything's good. But at the end of the day, like the real piece there is the mindset because, if you, if you are going in, into a fight, which like if the economy gets really bad, it's kind of what we're going into. You're going into a bit of a fight. Mm-hmm. Um, you got to make peace with that worst case possible. Out- like what is the worst possible thing that can happen to you and kind of make peace with that. Um, yeah. And I think that that is like a great, a great point. Yeah. Prepare for that. And you know, what's funny is that oftentimes we like to, we are called warriors or when somebody says that, you know what, I'm worried that this is going to happen. You might be told, you know what, don't be negative. Don't be pessimistic. But there are certain times in life, there are certain periods, and I'm sure a lot of people can relate to it, where the worst outcome is actually significantly worse than the worst outcome. And then it makes you question, like, if I couldn't even, fig- like COVID, for example, like who could have predicted this was going to happen? Not in a million years. You could have always forecasted or budgeted for, let's say, if you wanted to quit your job and you're trying to save up some money so that you could <laughs> follow your passion, like six months to nine months of you know income saved up so that you could give yourself that break. Never in a million years would you have thought that it was going to take almost two years, three years now for this yeah. to happen. And so it also begs the question, are my worries helping me? with the survival instinct that they're giving me or are they limiting me and paralyzing my thought process and my, my, my the formation of the right habits that I need to get to where I need to be. And so again, it goes back yeah. to that point of being present because when you're present, you're not preoccupied with whatever your ego is projecting. And you know, like the achievements that we love and that we seek all the time is also a projection of ego. Like, I want my time here to mean something. I want to achieve this and this and that. And all this is projection into the future. But what that does is it prevents you from being present. It prevents you from that feeling of being alive, from perception, from the proper perception where all your senses are in play. And you could actually take in everything you're seeing and be like, wow, this is, uh, it feels good to be here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that's a that's a really interesting point and something that I've heard. So I feel like you learned a lot of this probably from your upbringing and like the struggles that you went through earlier in your life. And that's something that I've heard um, a lot from some of my friends who have been um, to like, you know, different areas of the world where they maybe have more of a recent history of like war and turmoil and like bad things yeah. happening is like, yeah, those, those things are awful, but there's also kind of a weird sense of like, 
happiness in a way that they don't, that we don't have kind of, and not necessarily happiness, but it's like when they're together, when you're together with your family and everything's going great, like that moment, I think is so much more special for people who are going through shit than people who like, you know, are raised kind of in the situation that I guess I am, you know, where like things are like, I don't have a reason to think that like a bomb is going to come through my house or something. And it's like yeah. those, like those, those moments, you're much more present. in. I feel like, is that the way you, you feel like, um, that you kind of learned how to, some of this mindset from like your upbringing, maybe? Um, kind of, kind of, but I think the majority of the growth and I, I, I hope I'm, I still have a long way to go on my journey, but I think the majority of the growth and the evolution has been consciously and intentionally sought from me. Same. And the reason I had to seek it was because I always had this inner voice within me that was telling me things are not okay for me, or maybe that, I'm not where I'm supposed to be, or maybe that I'm not doing the things I'm supposed to be doing, or maybe that that's not my story to write and that I need to write a different story. And I think it's something that a lot of people can relate to, but mm -hmm. it's all about, it sounds a little cheesy, but it's all about, you know, this saying that nothing should interfere with the development of the hero that is within you. And yes. right, you are the hero of your own story. You are the main character of your own story. And so you could either seek a life where things are determined for you, or you could take a gamble and seek the more thrilling and exciting and yeah, absolutely intentional way yeah. and be like, I'm probably going to hit my head multiple times doing this, but I don't think it's going to be lethal. I think it's going to make me feel excited about being alive and i think it's going to help me develop into a better version of myself a higher version yeah. of myself and yeah. so i want to go for it you're going to evolve like you said earlier like we we are put on this planet our purpose is to evolve and i think you know we're we're, we're three grown men here you know we we as men uh, all of similar age, I think we were kind of raised to ignore a lot of what our bodies and minds were telling us. You know, we were raised in a way that, you know, didn't encourage us to look inward. And so earlier on in this conversation, you were talking about how we must evolve as human beings. And in order to do that, we have to identify our pain points. Like you have to look inward and that's a really hard and scary thing to do. You're going to, like you said, you're going to hit your head. It's going to be hard. There's going to be a lot of turbulence. I think most people are really afraid to look inward. So if you ask someone, hey, what are your pain points? Oh, shit. They can tell you pain points about their ideal client. They can tell, tell you pain points about their, you know, their business. But once, once you have to be that vulnerable with yourself, that is really challenging and you have to face those inner demons. You have to do that shadow work and then you have to reinvent yourself and, you know, rewire those neuro pathways to become who you want to be. Most people are afraid to do that. And that's a really hard it thing. It takes courage. It takes it's courage. one of the most, it takes a lot of courage. Yeah. Yeah. What, 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 what were you going to say? No, I'm saying it's one of the most courageous act you could do. Yeah. Because... I mean, you see successful people and you have a perception of who's successful or not, but you never know what they're going through on their internal journey, mm -hmm. right? And everybody wears multiple masks when they present themselves to the world and they present themselves to their friends and to their loved ones. But at the end of the day, when you come, when you come back home, you've got to take all these masks. And then you look at yourself in the mirror and I think the biggest question you need to ask yourself is, who am I? But like, really, who am I? And if I were to ask, you know, you, Josh, and you, Travis, who do you think you are, you know, when nobody's watching, when you come back home and you can be your true self and your true comfortable self, who do you come up with? What version of yourself do you come up with? Can you answer that question or do you find it hard? Do you find it easy to answer? Who are you? Sense yeah. of self is something I've been working on myself lately is... You know, in the age of social media, in the age of presenting the way that we do often online, I want to make sure that I show up as I am. I want to show up truthfully and genuine in a genuine way. 
And I think a lot of times with always being, always being, you know, in out in the world, putting something out in the world. I think it's, it can be challenging sometimes to reflect and be like, is the, am I being true to myself? And yeah. then that sense of self almost gets challenged in a way. And you're like, okay, well, I, now I'm like, I need to, to continue to dig into this. Cause I want to be very certain. I want to, that's like, to me, one of the most important things that you can be certain of is like who you are. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, think about it. The second you are not being true to yourself, you are creating a different version of reality because the world is going to take you for what you're saying, right? Like if you tell somebody something, if you tell, if you promise a client something, you're going to move on in that version of reality where this thing is going to be tested. And so you have all these simulations that come into play that are based on this hypothesis. Right. It's going to like, it's a funny, it's a funny, it's a funny thought, but I was walking the other day with my mother-in-law and she pointed to a house and told me, this is where we're going to live 30 years ago. And I'm like, you know something, if you had made that decision, I wouldn't be married to your daughter today because that decision of where you were going to live would have dictated where the kids would have gone to school, where they would have gone to university, the career opportunities that would have presented themselves 20 something years later that led me to meeting her daughter. And so imagine if you go with something that is not true to yourself, mm -hmm. all the different simulations that are gonna happen that are based on that shaky foundation. Mm -hmm. And that could be one of the reasons why we're not happy sometimes with the lives we're leading because we're not being true to ourselves. And because the version of reality that is presenting itself, we know deep down is not the version that we really desire. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's one of the, hardest truths to for people to face because it's the most complicated truth or problem um for take take uh anxiety and depression for instance which are like very real things but i think one of the there's a lot of elements to it and i think like so many more people than you know we want to admit are like having mental health issues like that because of the way they treat their bodies. Um, you know, the way they speak to themselves, the way they speak to themselves, yeah. what's going on in their lives. But I've, I think that a big part of it too is people who are um, like, you're feeling anxiety as a response to your, your mind kind of you, you're, li you're living like the wrong life. You Not know what I mean? Truthfully. Yeah. Like, if you're forcing yourself to like show up to this office and do this thing that you hate every day, that sucks. Um, it's, I mean, it, like, how are you not going to have anxiety doing that? Um, conversely though, like if you are, you know, on the other side of it, if you do, if you do kind of like choose a path that you, that you think you love because, and you're like thinking like, Oh, I kind of actually like to do this thing. Like I really just like to, do landscaping, but like, that's not who my identity is that I'm portraying. So I'm going to go this way. It's like, maybe, you, you know what I'm saying? Like, I think so much of the anxiety and depression and high blood pressure and all these like physical issues that we have are because we kind of need to make like major life changes. And that is just so hard. Like 100%. it's so hard to even like decide, like, how do you even know what to do? It's yeah. like, you're having these flags that are saying you're you're living the wrong life but you don't know, even know what the right life is and that's like the hardest part i think and there's pressure 100%. on you from other like you're worried about what other people are going to think if you mm -hmm. don't show up the way you have been yeah but this is about you dude yeah yeah it's your life yeah, and, you, and you know what i found to be the antidote of that level of anxiety or that's that way that anxiety presents itself is you could always hack it and what i mean by hacking that feeling is the only thing that proves really effective against anxiety for me. And I think for a lot of people is progress. Yes. And so it does not have to mean moving from one identity to the other, because that takes a lot of time that takes trial and error that takes some adjustments some fine tuning. And more importantly, it takes data collection. It takes actual data where you go through life and you gather data, you collect it through experience, and then you figure out what fine tuning you need to do. And so Doing that is scary, but a hack to it is progress. And what I mean by that is if you are doing something that is making you miserable, 
the way to do progress is to do more of something that makes you happy. And so if you're doing none of it today, mm -hmm. the first step would be like, okay, how can I do one hour of this a week? Something that is ridiculously easy to say yes to, something that is so hard to say no to. How can I, because remember, you, you oftentimes might be starting from zero, from point zero. And all you have to do to get the ball rolling is momentum. And to get momentum, even slow steps sometimes are all that's needed to get the ball rolling. Because then when you take that small step, A, you're going to get endorphins, you're going to feel serotonin, you're going to get a rush, you're going to be happy. And B, it's going to reinforce, these. this feeling is going to reinforce itself. And so without you trying, you're going to step it up a little bit with time. Mm -hmm. And so progress does not have to be substantial. You know, like if, if, if my friend is struggling with alcohol and he can't stop and he's telling me that every time he's stopping, he's going through depression or he's having these very strong mood swings. And I'm like, and this is somebody I would relate to from my previous version of myself, my lower version of myself. I'd be like, you know, what I found to be most effective is don't quit cold turkey. But next time you find yourself in that position, try to stop after your second drink. So take it. Do what you want, but it doesn't have to be excessive. It doesn't have to be subconscious. It doesn't have to be totally subconscious and totally behavioral focused where there's no effort and no intention on your part. Have a couple of drinks and then say, you know what? I'm feeling better now, but I want to try to be intentional and I want to take control. So I'm going to try to stop today. Yeah. And then tomorrow, do the same. That's that's conscious effort now. That's no longer subconscious effort. And conscious effort takes energy. It takes willpower. But the point is, it doesn't have to be dramatically hard to the point that makes you say, no, it's not worth it. Or to the point where your mind is coming up with excuses as to why you shouldn't do it. Just get the ball rolling with the silliest, easiest, and most stupid step you can think of. See how that feels. And then build on that one little step at a time. And I think that would be the best antidote to anxiety. I think so. Yeah, I, think I you're always, right. I get so excited when I see people who are like majorly overweight and like struggling, who have been struggling with it forever when they just start like walking every day. Yeah, they do one yeah. thing. It's like, dude, I think you're so badass if you, if you do that. It's like, there's so many people who will never make that first step. It's like, it's like the courage to just, not to, to accept like, man, I'm starting all the way back here, but I'm going to fucking do it anyways. You know what Dude, I mean? Like I'm yeah. so much more impressed. And I think this is partially because this is my space. This is my industry. If I see a person who has a very unhealthy and overweight lifestyle, say that we have two people, same lifestyle. One of them says, you know, January 1st hits, I'm going to go to the gym five days a week. I'm going to cut out carbs. I'm going to cut out sugar, no alcohol, this and that. To me, I'm like, you're going to last a week. But if I, exactly. the other person that says, I really need to make a life change, I'm going to go for a five minute walk every morning this week. Yeah. I'm set. I'll put my money on that person every day yeah. because 1% improvements are easy. They're yeah. so easy. Even if the, even if the, that person just said, I'm going to take five minutes to intentionally breathe, just, yeah. Every day, I'm going to put my money on that person because like you said, Carl, it doesn't take drastic change to make monumental progress and progress isn't linear, but even just a 1% improvement added up over the course of a year is massive. Like 1.01 .01 to the power of 365 is 37.7. Yeah. But if you try to do all of it, which most people do, they think, oh, we have to do all or nothing. You know, this all or nothing mindset. If I can't do it all, then what's the point? It's not going to work small incremental steps in developing small good habits that are easy, attractive, obvious, and satisfying. That's yeah. the secret. That's what's going to get you to where you, know, you want to be. You know, another reason why you can put your money on that person too, is because they're being realistic, which means they have looked inward They've accepted who they are, where they mm -hmm. are, and what the next step is versus being like, fuck it, I'm going cold turkey. I'm hitting the gym every day, blah, 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 blah. You're, they're not being real. You're like, you're not there yet. Nope. You, th that's not who you are. You know what I mean? Like, and Absolutely. there's nothing wrong with that. But th I think that's a huge, to, to kind of pull it back to what you said earlier, like that's, that is like the first step is you got to be honest with yourself about like who you are and, and where you are on the journey. 
Yeah, and and the best the best way also to to approach it is to be aware of your own behavioral patterns because that does not change. You are the output yeah, today. That's hard, right? Of your behavioral patterns and of the way you think, and to go from a specific behavioral pattern that is built up on on millions of data points, you're not going to be able to shift all this kind of behavioral dynamic cold turkey day one because most of it is subconscious most of it is is on autopilot you're not even aware that you're you're following that pattern of behavior mm -hmm. and so i love that because yeah you take that one little behavioral tweak which takes so little effort but you know is sustainable and then you build on it and you have a magic formula there totally yeah. agree it, it, this is like I, last point i think on this is like our brains are wired like water in a river, right? We do the same habit over and over and over again. And just like water carves into rock, the longer you do that, the more consistently you do that, the stronger that river is going to be. Now, if you want to divert that river and you want to change your process and you want to change your habit, you can't just divert the river all at once. It's going to flood everywhere. There's going to be a million, like it's not going to work. But if you just start, just like a drop of water, one at a time, a drop at a time, eventually you will divert that river. You will create a new pathway. You will create a new groove and you will create a new person. But it starts with that small step, that first drop. And I think that all of this that we've talked about today, this is how you get through recession. This is how you get through hard times. This is how you create advantage out of your adversities. This is how you come out on top. It's not about specific financial strategies or this and that. It's about willpower. It's about mindset. It's about believing that you can. It's about understanding yourself, who you are as a person, and what you're capable of accomplishing. But you have to be aware. You have to be real with yourself. You have to look inward. That's what's going to get you through this. That's what's going to get you through any hard time, any obstacle this is the solution. So this has been a, a phenomenal conversation, Carl. And again, like completely didn't even did not expect this to go this way. And I couldn't be happier about it because this is a, a subject that's like very near and dear to my heart. So I really appreciate your vulnerability and your willingness to share and expand. And um, I, I really like the way your brain works, man. This has been a, a really oh, good conversation. I appreciate, appreciate it. it, Josh. Thank you. I yeah. really enjoyed it, too. Yeah. Thank you, man. I, I'm definitely, I want to learn more about you. I want to follow you. I want to keep in touch. Of course, I know our listeners are going to want to as well. Um, why don't we do this? Can you leave us with like a little, you know, final words of wisdom and then give yourself the plug and uh, tell us where we can find you and learn more about you and follow you? Yeah. I mean, uh... <laughs> I'm, I'm trying to resist getting into the business talk because I don't want to seem like this commercial person, given my background. So I want to appeal to your listener base from the from the from the standpoint of what your show is all about, which is struggle to strength, and 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 the two cents that I'd like to contribute, and this is based on experience and based on my past, is struggle is your best teacher, but it should not define who you are as a human being. You are so much more than your struggles. You are so much more than your thoughts. You are so much more than your emotions. Even your thoughts and your emotions do not identify who you are as a human being. Because with the right intent and with the right level of consciousness, you can alter the way you think and you can alter the way you feel. And so going back or talking about what a lot of people say quality of life and how we like to attribute quality of life to luxury and to finances i say the best quality of life is achieved when your thoughts and your emotions are of the highest quality and when you can work with intention to fix the quality of your thoughts and your emotions one little baby step at a time at a way that is achievable attainable but more importantly sustainable your quality of life is going to be the highest it's ever been. I love that. And I could not, love that. could not agree more. You can, it's, it's so interesting. You can tell the people who have done a lot of this work and gone to therapy and like really made an effort to dot, to look inward. Um, I love it, man. That that's I could not agree with you more. And those five amazing last words. Thank you so much. Oh, my um, pleasure. 
Now, now where, where can we find you? I want I want to follow you. I want to stay in touch. I want to stay connected. Yeah. So I think I, I've given my links. Uh, I filled up my links. Uh, I'm I'm on LinkedIn, and for anyone who's interested in business, my book is out. It's not going to talk about the stuff that we just spoke about. It's going to talk about you know how the big private equity investors and the fortune 500 companies approach value creation. So it talks about, you know, what is value? How do, how do people define value? Cause it's such a fluid term, but it also looks at it from the perspective of an exchange where something is to be gained that outweighs the cost of doing. And so we talk a lot about how companies protect their assets and resources through governance, how they grow their business through strategy and how do they procure and allocate capital in the right channels so that they could generate the maximum return on investment. I know I'm shifting right now and I'm just, no, this is great. Yeah. 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 So uh, the book is called uh, uh, the game of value creation. It's on Barnes and Noble and it's on Amazon already. And whoever is interested in understanding how private equity players, how fortune 500 companies, how the big investment bankers and management consultants approach, that's so-called, you know, we're often told be a person of value or how do you create value? So this gets all into that kind of stuff, which is less exciting than the stuff we've been talking about, but yeah, but, that's but how still, you can find no, me. Still Super very interesting. Important. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to go check it out for sure. I am definitely going to check it out. I was just actually going to follow you on LinkedIn. So thank you to Carl. Thank you again, man. This has been a phenomenal conversation. I'm very excited to keep in touch and continue to, you know, stay tuned on, uh, on our journeys. Right. Um, Absolutely. Thank you again for sharing yours with us and our listeners. And thank you to all of our listeners for tuning in to another episode of the struggle to strength podcast. We will see y'all next week. 